Join me as we pray together and prepare to read and hear from God's word. God who creates us and calls to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us to hear your word and embolden us to respond faithfully as we seek to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Listen now for the word of God. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. So this winter, our church has discussion groups reading this book. You've seen it. You've heard me talk about it. It is the sacred overlap, learning to live faithfully in the space between by J.R. Briggs. It's a book about Venn diagrams. You know, those overlapping circle diagrams that demonstrate where two or more topics or thoughts or things overlap and share things in common. But the book isn't only about Venn diagrams, of course but how they help us to start thinking of those places of sacred overlap we encounter as people of faith and as people in relationships and in general. We live in a world where there's a lot of us versus them thinking or either or thinking, as Briggs puts it in the book. He writes about how Jesus was committed to crossing those either or waters of the cultural and societal wars of his day. Jesus was less interested in where the dividing line was and more interested in finding that place of overlap, of shared hopes and understanding. And Briggs encourages us, Jesus's people, to learn how to do this too in ways that are faithful and true to the scriptures and the teachings of Jesus. It's a good book. I think the members of both discussion groups would highly recommend it. But this week, as I read the gospel for today's sermon, I was inspired by Briggs's invitation to think not in terms of either or, but to discover the both and. And so I want to explore Jesus's first words here in Mark's gospel and how they invite us to understand an invitation that is both deep and wide. And so first, Jesus announces the kingdom of God, and we will learn to think of that kingdom as both already and not yet. The kingdom of God is both already and not yet. Now, this seems like a difficult concept, like, high treetop theology. But if we only pay attention, we can see and feel this reality and realize that we are standing in the sacred overlap of the kingdom of God. Let me explain that. So far in Mark's gospel, Jesus has been baptized by John in the Jordan. We read that last week on Baptism of Our Lord Sunday. Following his baptism, Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to face the accuser for 40 days. We will read about that in a couple of weeks on the first Sunday of Lent. But in Mark's telling of the story, Jesus has not yet spoken. 
So far, Jesus has been present, but not speaking. His first words in this gospel come in verse 15 and are to announce that the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near. But if we back up a verse to verse 14, we hear a detail in the story that we should not miss. The one who baptized Jesus, John, his cousin, the one who proclaimed that Jesus was the one sent by God, the one who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit, John has been arrested. That does not seem like it fits the kingdom of God reality that Jesus proclaims. This forerunner of Jesus, this Elijah-like prophet, this one who was calling people to repentance in the wilderness, the very one who baptized our Lord and Savior, is in jail. And later in Mark's gospel in chapter 6, we will read the story of John's beheading for the amusement and enjoyment of King Herod Antipas' wife. That does not seem to be congruent with the kingdom of God coming near or being fulfilled. In one space, we have Jesus beginning his ministry. In the other, we have this injustice playing out with John the Baptist's arrest and execution. We feel this tension in our world today. We are sure that God is present in our world. We can tell stories about the places and ways that we have seen God. We experience the kingdom of God as we joyfully share ministry and mission together as we stand in thin places and feel God's presence. As you hear about what God is doing in faraway places like Zambia, if you came and hear, heard the Presbyterian women speaker this past week, you no doubt heard about God's kingdom appearing in the mission work there. The kingdom of God is already here among us. But then we also live in a world where terrible things happen and injustice is carried out regularly and we feel the pain of our neighbors and friends and family and even in our own lives. We experience a great longing for a time when God will set all things right and bend all things back to the good. This is the not yet part of the already not yet. The kingdom of God has already begun, but it is not yet complete. Jesus will minister in such a way that everywhere he is, so is the kingdom of God. But he will also be very aware of the ongoing need of God's kingdom in the world and in the lives of the people who surround him. The kingdom is both already and not yet. Second, the good news invites both repentance and belief. The good news invites both repentance and belief. Here in Mark 1, Jesus announces the kingdom come near, and then he invites his listeners to, in verse 15, repent and believe the good news. The order is important. They aren't to repent and believe in order to usher in the kingdom of God. They aren't to repent and believe so that God would come to them. They are to repent and believe because the kingdom is now and God is here. We don't earn God's grace or God's goodness or God's presence. God gives it freely. We repent, we do good works, not to earn anything, but because we have experienced the good news of God. It's our only possible response. We live lives of gratitude that glorify God. Here at the very beginning of Mark's story of the life of Jesus, the good news has come for the so far not repentant. And so Jesus invites people to repent and believe. Repent of sins and believe in the hopeful thing that God is doing. That's what we are also doing each week as we confess our sins, both corporately and personally, as we take a moment to silently pray 
We have not always lived lives of gratitude that glorify God, but we are invited to repent of that. And then we are assured of God's grace once again. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news. We declare that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Water is poured into the font so that we remember that God has already claimed us and claims us still in the waters of our baptism. We repent and we believe the good news for ourselves once again. Jesus was present in the world, inviting people to himself and sharing the good news with them before they repented and believed it. What does that mean about the shape our ministry now should take? I think it looks a lot more like a church that is welcoming and present with all people. A church that shares hopeful news with joy and assurance that it is already for everyone. A church that believes that Jesus is able to call people to himself once he is already present with them no matter the state. The order matters. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is here. Now you are invited to repent and believe the good news. Finally, becoming a disciple takes both a moment and a lifetime. Becoming a disciple takes both a moment and a lifetime. Having announced the good news of the kingdom of God and having given his general invitation Jesus then begins to call his disciples. Here in Mark, he calls two sets of brothers, all fishermen. Simon and Andrew are casting their nets. James and John are mending their nets. Jesus calls, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And in both cases, we are told that they immediately do. In a moment, they decide to follow Jesus. They leave their nets and their fishing boats and their families to do so. Right then, Mark tells us. There's a moment of decision, we might say. Walk the aisle, pray the prayer, give your heart, affirm your baptismal promises, Make a decision to follow Jesus, however that looked for you. You perhaps have done that. You've had that moment where you repented and believed in some form or fashion. And sometimes we think that's the big deal. That's the moment that matters. And it is a big deal. Of course it is. Saying yes to Jesus has the power to turn your life upside down and change everything. But the yes is just the beginning of the beginning. The rest of following Jesus takes a lifetime. These disciples of Jesus left their nets and then they spent the next three years of their lives and then the next however many years they had left following Jesus. If we just look at Simon Peter, we see a disciple who longs to follow Jesus faithfully, but who along the way has many opportunities to falter or flourish and follow again and again. At Caesarea Philippi in Mark 8, we hear him declare that Jesus is the Messiah. But then... Peter rebukes Jesus, the Messiah, when Jesus begins to teach them about the Messiah's impending death. Jesus will have to call Peter back to him again. When Jesus is arrested in Mark 14, Peter warms himself by a fire in the courtyard and publicly denies knowing Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. It's a moment of fear threatening to override three years of faith. Days later, at another fireside, this time on a beach, Jesus will call Peter to follow him again. For Peter, it's not only about the moment. No doubt that moment was a story that he told over and over again to many people, perhaps even to our gospel writer Mark. 
But for Peter, following Jesus was also about the lifetime commitment, the ups and downs, the missteps and regrouping and repenting, the deciding again and again to follow Jesus. For us, that's almost always true, too. The moment of decision at whatever age and whatever setting, however it happened for you, is important. I'll just pause to say this. In a Presbyterian church, we often have people who have been churched their whole lives. Me, too. There was never a time that I can remember not hearing about Jesus, not knowing that I was called to follow Jesus, not knowing that I was a baptized child of God, beloved and called. But even if that's your beautiful story, and it is a beautiful story, you most likely had a moment when you decided with your own ability and mind and decision that yes, I will be a disciple of Jesus. And whether your story involves a lifetime of church with a quiet decision somewhere along the way, or it involves Jesus calling you from seemingly out of the blue and inviting a big decision that changes the direction of everything, even after the initial decision, you might find, like Peter, that you need to accept this again and again. It's both a moment and it's a lifetime. This morning, we hear the voice of Jesus again, coming to us from our gospel reading, inviting us to these both and places. So let's accept his invitation today, either again, or maybe even for the first time. Jesus calls us to be people of the kingdom of God. Whenever we live lives of faithfulness, whenever we seek to partner in mission with Jesus, whenever we love our neighbors and our enemies, we remember that kingdom is already near, already among us, already brought to earth by Jesus and his ministry, now in our hands. We are also called to be builders of this kingdom, for it is not yet complete. We are to pray for it to come to earth. We are to seek it first. We are to embody its reality in our loving, forgiving, welcoming actions. Jesus calls us to live as kingdom people. Will you? Jesus calls us to both repent and believe the good news. He is here for your sake. He has ushered in the kingdom. This is good news. Here present for your sake, he invites your repentance and belief. Repentance doesn't just mean that we say we are sorry. When we sin, we have turned away from God and we have headed in another direction. Repentance means we turn back to God and head toward him. Are you turning back to God today? Are you believing that the good news Jesus has ushered in is for you and you want to live a grateful life for his glory? Jesus invites us to repent and believe. Will you? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Jesus calls us to follow him in both a moment and for a lifetime. First, there is a moment of conscious decision, whether it happens with bold movement, like leaving your fishing boat and family behind, or whether it's a quiet moment in a church pew when the spirit stirred in your heart. And maybe that's happening for you this morning. 
if this is a decision you are making for the first time, please tell me about it. You can um, either meet me at the door this morning or send me a message or use the slip in your bulletin. Let me share the joy of the moment with you and help you figure out what's next. And let us pray for you now. Lord, we pray for anyone who this day is making a decision to follow you. Help them be assured of your grace for them. Help us to be a church who encourages them and loves them well. Amen. On the other hand, some of you have been following for a while now. You've experienced the peaks and the valleys of the journey. It can be wearying and painful sometimes, the learning and the growing that goes into a life of discipleship. It can also be exciting and joy-filled to experience the kingdom of God firsthand. And so pray with me for those of us who have been on the journey for a while. Lord, be with your disciples in this room and on Zoom and in this worship space as they continue to seek you and your kingdom in their lives and in the world. Give them strength and courage to keep following you faithfully. Amen. Following Jesus is both a moment and a lifetime. Jesus' invitation to us today, it's deep and it's wide. It's not an invitation of dividing lines or straight columns. It's one of overlap, where we find that the kingdom is both already and not yet, where we experience the goodness of God before, while, and after we repent, where we follow Jesus right now, again and again, our whole lives long. It's a messy sort of sacred overlap, but it's one where we belong. May the Lord hold us there. To God be all glory and honor and wisdom and power now and forever. Amen.